Okay, oh, let me do the tagging. I'm gonna try to do this. Paste, post, hit that, hit this, pin. Okay, I think I've got it. Hey, hey, how are you? Thank you for joining. <laughs> I actually um, messaged your husband today. I don't know if you're still watching this, but I had a couple questions about some of the genealogies and Genesis and numbers and stuff. So, yeah. Where are you guys located, actually? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I messaged him. <laughs> Hey, welcome. Thank you for joining. Um, Linden, Washington. Okay, okay. Cool. Very cool. So, um, for those who have joined, you can comment where you're from. Um, yeah. I'm just waiting to get started right on the Canadian... Oh, so you guys are right close to... Uh, you guys are close to Vancouver, or British Columbia. I One of my sister-in-laws uh, lives out there. Actually, two of them. One or two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Hello, thanks for joining. Um, for those of you who have joined, you can comment where you're from. It would be cool to see. Um, I'm just going to wait for a couple more people before we get cracking. Yeah, BC. Do you guys go to BC pretty often? Gulfport, MS. Is MS Massachusetts? Massachusetts? I don't actually know how to say that. Not often, but yes, we do go. I've never been to BC. I've always wanted to go and see the mountains. We've talked about moving out there. Hey, thank you for joining. Yeah, you guys can comment where you're from. I'm going to be doing a bunch of interacting and stuff with this. Oh, great, Brendan's here. Um, tonight, we are talking about Christianity, science, and the ancient Near East. But before we get into that... Um, especially for Indian food. Canada does have good Indian food, and that's because we have uh, a huge Indian population. Um, you can comment where you guys are coming from and what you're drinking. I'm drinking a whiskey called Akintoshin. It is like an American oaked whiskey. It's pretty good. Um, racist. Not racist, I'm just honest. We have a huge Indian population. Um, racist. <laughs> Okay, cool. Thank you guys for joining. Um, I'm probably just going to get cracking. People will join in as they see fit. So tonight we're talking about Christianity, science, and uh, Mississippi, and the ancient Near East. Um, Brennan, I see you there, but just not yet. I don't know if I'm ready. <laughs> Shouldn't you be with your girl, too? It is Brendan's girlfriend's um, birthday today, so you can all wish her a happy birthday. Um, so... Um, sword and bourbon, this is officially what this is, I haven't done it very often in the past little while, um, but sword and bourbon is officially about having real, real conversations about tough topics, um, we are both watching, oh man, about tough topics and then being okay to not have all the answers. So tonight is going to be especially perfect for that because... The idea of Christianity and science has been puzzling to people for a very, very long time. Celebrating her birthday by watch the pressure is insurmount. Your birthday's tomorrow. Oh my goodness! I happy birthday to everyone. Um, thanks for tuning in tonight. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So tonight we're t that's what we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about Christianity and science in the ancient Near East. There are reasons that I want to talk about this. So um, one of those reasons is there's been a bunch that's been talked about um, as far as Christianity and its relationship to science. And despite how much it's been talked about, there is, in my estimation, in my opinion, a ton of confusion and a ton of misunderstanding about what actually needs to be believed in order to be a Christian. Um... The other thing I want to say is tonight is not going to be a debate. 
Um, this is a conversation. So you guys are already, we have the same horoscope. <laughs> um, tonight is about having a conversation, not about having a debate. I am not here to answer every single one. Uh, I'm not here to answer every single one of your theological or scientific questions. I'm here as best as I can to give clarity or give direction. So if you're here for a debate, I mean, you can comment. I probably just won't argue with you because I have all the power in that sense. Um, before we get into the nitty gritty of what I think the relationship of science and theology and scripture is, um, I'm going to share my story with all of its questions and all of its confusions to kind of set the stage. So um, I went to university for physics, that's my undergrad, and I did my master's in theology. And so even though I'm not an expert, um, I do feel like I can talk about this with a little bit of understanding and hopefully add a bit of clarity. So here's my story. For everyone who's joined, welcome. Thank you for tuning in. You guys can comment where you're from, what you're drinking. You have to have one drink for every person's birthday, man. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> I've got a bunch in the other room. Okay, so here's my story, and it'll set the stage. Um, I grew up as a very conservative Baptist boy. I believed in a 6,000-year-old earth. I believed in a literal six-day creation, um, thanks to probably reading a lot less Augustine maybe than I should have and hearing a lot more of Ken Ham's ideas of stuff um, when I was in Sunday school. Um, yeah, cheers to Glad Med and cheers to Brendan, your girlfriend. Here's a, here's a cheers to you guys. Um, yeah, and so this was the only way that I knew how to look at the universe around me. It's just how I was brought up. I didn't think about anything else. The only framework that I had to look at the universe around me was a literal young earth creationist worldview. In fact, I thought so, that was how you did it, that if you didn't believe that, you know, like you have to start asking questions about, are you really saved? Um, literal everything, also Baptist background, yeah. And so, I first really heard about evolution, like actually heard about evolution, not as a straw man, so not as like, you know, the evolutionists are out to kill all the Christians. I first really heard about evolution when I went to university. Uh, when I went to study physics for my undergrad. I did obviously hear about evolution when I was in high school. Um, I remember having a debate in grade 11, and, but I had like, you know, all my answers, all my answers in Genesis. <laughs> that's a good joke. If you don't get that joke, I don't know, that's a, cla that's a good joke. I'm patting myself on the back. That's like, a, if, that's like the most Christian young earth creationist joke I can make. Um, anyway, so I had all my answers, but I went away to universities when I first started asking real questions. However, I did have a bunch of questions just because of how my brain works growing up. I've always had theological or scientific questions um, when it comes to a very young earth. I mean, I have them on both sides still, but I, some of the questions I had, like I remember asking my friends, you know, how did humanity populate the earth? How are, they, how are Adam and Eve supposed to be fruitful and multiply? Like, did their kids have sex with each other? We more responsibly call it population genetics and etc, etc, but though, that's a real question. Um, where did the cities come from? After Cain kills Abel, he's like, God, these people, these people in other cities, they're gonna kill me because of what I've done. Where did those people come from? Um, to be honest, even talking about Cain, where did Cain find his wife? Was his wife his sister? Um, was all science anti-God? Was Adam, I remember one day asking myself, was Adam, after God made Adam, was Adam one second year old or 30 years old? Like, did he get 30 years of intelligence, like lightning bolted into him? Or did he like, you know, we just had some friends over this afternoon and there's a baby who can't speak. And I have a nephew and he can't talk. He just kind of like grunts and like looks at us all shifty. Was that Adam in a man's body? Um, so those are my questions growing up. And then in university, when I went to go study physics, um, many, many more questions popped up into my head. I'm going to be reading stuff as you guys write them, but I've got to like get awkwardly close. So my eyesight's not the best. So I'll get close in a sec. Um, 
University, many, many more questions popped into my head. Not just from like an evolutionary biological background, but from the stance and of the physical sciences. That's what I was studying. So I had questions about light and gravity and energy and creation, the age of stars. How does light travel through a vacuum? How does light travel past massive gravitational fields, supernovas, universal expansion, cosmic radiation, um, radiometric dating? All of these things were massive questions that popped into my head. I remember having an assignment in like third year um, about calculating the amount of energy in the universe. And so, this is in my thermodynamics class, so since energy can't be created or destroyed, we had to look at how many photons were in the universe and derive energy, how much energy was in the universe from there. And I compared the 6,000 and 8,000 years to like the 10 to 14 billion years. And I wrote in my thing, like, you know, like, on my assignments, I was pretty open with my professors, be like, hey, I was brought up to believe that the universe is only six to 8,000. This is the difference that you get. I don't know what to make of this. Um, and my professor kind of just wrote, LOL, we would have run out of energy a long time ago if it was only this much. And I remember thinking to myself, like, hmm, you know, I've never thought about that. Um, one of my professors, probably my best professor as far as physics is concerned, was a guy named Peter Berg. He was a German, British, PhD, super, like the picture, whatever you imagine a physics professor to be, he was that, but also cool. He loved Richard Feynman, who, if you know anything about physics, he's like the coolest physicist ever. Um, and he and I would get into conversations all the time about God and the universe and creation and what's going on. I'd go to his office after class and I'd be like, hey, Dr. Berg, I've got a question. We'd sit and we'd chat. And um, he would always say to me, I can't do his accent because it was British and German and his S's whistled. But he would be like, Josh, don't listen to my colleagues. They, they don't want to believe that God exists. He's like, you know what? You can't not because of the fine-tuning argument. Maybe not the fine-tuning argument the way it is popularly, popularly, is that how you say it? Described, um, but fine-tuning in the sense of how do things interact, he sounds hot. <laughs> you know what, he actually had a really beautiful wife and so he probably was. My memory of him is pretty different. Anyway, so he's like, um, my memory of him is, uh, or we're having this conversation, he's like, hey, fine-tuning argument, fine-tuning argument, um, but what he means is this, the entire universe, every object in the universe, so me to my phone, like I'm talking at my phone, interacts with each other. That's how it works. Um, but they interact with each other in a very normal and measurable way. Um, they relate to each other as the inverse of the distance squared, which sounds really famous and or really, you know, heady and in, uh, intellectual. Essentially means the distance between me and my phone is probably like, I don't know, half a, me a meter maybe, um, three feet. I in I'm interacting with my phone as one divided by that number squared. I know that doesn't sound important, but everything makes sense in the universe because of that. Our relationship to other planets, even cars, like we can calculate momentum and velocity. We can determine, you know, like I don't know if you guys have played online games. When I was a kid, I played this online pool game because it would make me feel like I was a, like a 1920s pool shark. Um, and you could calculate, you know, if I hit this ball at this angle, it's going to go this way. You can do that because of one over the distance squared. Everything works because of that. A car crashing into another car, two separate objects, not a billion objects, a billion particles crashing into another billion particles. Anyways, all of this matters because he would say, God exists, God exists, he has to exist. He had all these questions about if God was good or loving, and we would get into great conversations about that. Needless to say, as university went on, I had way less answers than I thought I would have, and way more questions than I started with. Um, and that's okay, because I, that's what thinking is supposed to be like. Um, 
if you can't challenge your thoughts, I mean, that's why I went to university. I remember showing up being like, hey, my first two years were, uh, I'm going to question, did Jesus rise from the dead and should I trust the Bible? And I came up the other end of that being like, yes, Jesus did rise from the dead and I can trust the Bible. My third and fourth year, we're putting the rest of the stuff up on the line. If you can't challenge your thoughts and you need to run away and hide your yourself or your kids or your friends or your family from other things people believe, um, you're essentially starting a cult. Like if, if you can't let your thoughts be confronted with other people's, you have to run away. You're essentially starting a cult. I mean, there's a ton of money in cults. I've definitely said that before in these live videos. There's money in cults. So if you're doing that, maybe you're in it for the money. Um, but I would say, do what I did. Just pull it up, put it all on the line. Ask yourself the questions that you need to ask. Um, so that's what I got from my undergrad. I got a ton of scientific information that led me to ask a million more questions. And then I went to seminary. So seminary was great um, as far as this stuff was concerned. I mean, seminary was very difficult. <laughs> um, but I'm very appreciate appreciative of it now. Um, in seminary, I had classes on hermeneutics, I had classes on Old Testament biblical theology, um, I read a ton of books, and one of my good friends was very, very confused about the topic of creation. And so what we decided to do was answer those questions together. We decided to do a bunch of studying on the things you needed to believe theologically, or what Genesis was even about theologically. Um, we started asking questions associated with like being a young earth creationist, about being an old earth creationist, um, about being a theistic evolutionist, about just being an evolutionist. We read books by Sailhamer and Walton, by Tremper Longman III, it's actually his name, um, by Tim Keller, by Michael, yeah, I read Michael Heiser's book, so there's a shout out. That's, that's, you guys should all read The Unseen Realm. If you've not read The Unseen Realm, Go read The Unseen Realm. It's by Michael Heiser. There you go. Um, anyway, so we asked ourselves all these questions, and it was at this moment, after doing all of this study, you know, I'm going to scroll up. Actually, I'm going to finish this section, and then I'm going to read some stuff. Um, it's at this moment that I realized something brand new for the first time. I once thought that if you were not a young earth creationist, um, you could not and did not believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, or the infallibility of scripture, you're kind of just rogue. Um, I believe that if you weren't a young earth creationist, you'd give up the gospel, you'd lose the idea that God is the creator of all things, um, the creator of all things, and, um, you know, that like if you gave up young earth creationism, that maybe you'd start losing the essence of Christianity. And then, I had this recognition, that most people, myself, I learned it from myself, I believed in a young earth because I felt I had to, to be a Christian. I thought that was the only thing that the Bible was teaching. In fact, I thought it was the thing that the Bible was teaching, and therefore, I needed to believe it. And then, of course, I came to scientific conclusions after that, um, based on that, but I believed those things because of that theological presupposition. Now, um, I'm going to move into the next section, but I... Okay, I'm going to keep... I missed a bunch of stuff, guys. I'm going to get nice and close, which is probably weird. Um, I just don't want to miss any massive questions. Such a funny question. How do you start researching these questions? Okay, yeah, I'll get back to some of this stuff. Um, off top, we you look like Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters. That's a compliment. You know what? I got told I look like Dave Grohl, and some of my um, housemates think I look like um, an old Benicio Del Toro and an old Brad Pitt. So, I mean, if I take all three of those people, whatever, I, I'll take it. So, young earth creationism, for the person who asked, is believing that the earth was made in six literal days and that the earth is somewhere between six and eight thousand years old. Um, that's young earth creationism in a nutshell. So, <laughs> um, this is, that's what I thought I had to believe. That's kind of what I've learned that if you're a young earth creationist, um, 
if you're a young earth creationist, then you're probably there because you feel that's what you need to believe theologically. For me, when I went to seminary, my eyes were um, opened. I started reading all of these Hebrew and ancient Near Eastern experts who were telling me what Genesis was actually about, and it was amazing. Um, it just, I felt like a, like a kid in a candy store, like I could believe and think through everything the way I was taught to on both sides and do it well and enjoy it, um, while also still questioning both sides because that's what a scientist and a theologian, theologian does. And so that's what I'm going to do right now. What we're going to do, you guys have questions, I'm going to do my best to start answering them as they come. Um, but what we're going to do right now is start going through and explaining what the theological basis of Genesis is. And I am going to share as we do that how Genesis interacts with Scripture. So how science and Scripture start to interact as I tell this story. So um, the first thing I want to say is... Oftentimes I've heard people who are young earth creationists say, myself, I used to say this all the time, you know, I just believe in a young earth because of a straightforward reading of the text. I read the text and it just says this straightforward and therefore I believe it. Um, that's wrong. It's, it's wrong on one level and then you can interpret it to be right, but that's your, that's your choice. So Genesis is primarily theological. It is not primarily scientific. It's first thing, the point of Genesis being written was not to teach us things about science, it was to teach us things about God. And that is a huge mindset change to start looking at scripture, You're not going to scripture to find out what or how scientifically the universe came into existence. You're going to scripture to see who brought this universe into existence. Um, even if Genesis was scientific, you know, pretend it was primarily scientific, it would be super dated. It would be like pre-germ theory dated, it would be pre-heliocentrism dated, pre-human um, like anatomy dated, or, you know, or instead of God like just revealing things to them, letting them do science their way, he would have like light it would be so advanced we wouldn't understand it you know it wouldn't be anything they would have understood three to five thousand years ago and we definitely wouldn't understand it even now so as we know our main goal when we read the bible is to do good exegesis that just means we're going to read the bible and its historical context and understand what the first reader or the first writer was saying to the first readers and then draw our conclusions from there so what seems, like I was saying before, what seems like a straightforward and plain reading of the text to us is not the same for them. So we say, <clears throat> whew, went down the wrong tube. So we say, hey, I just want to read Genesis 1, plain, straightforward, but we don't recognize that we are modern and western and they are ancient and eastern. You know, so my wife and I are traveling to the UK in about a month, and uh, I have some friends from over there, and like the way they talk about stuff is just different. You know, oh, we're gonna have some bangers and mash for dinner, which is a cool way of saying I'm gonna have like sausages and potatoes, but it's different, it's just different language. Um, all their words are used different. Um, I mean, I was thinking today, trying to understand, like, you know, what words have changed over time as I've been alive um, or over the past 20 30 years like the word gay used to just mean happy you know like what a gay fellow he would just be a cheery guy he'd be a happy dude nowadays gay means homosexual and it's mostly like in common vernacular people use it as an insult um, or like an exclamation anyways that's like that's that's across the pond you know that's like a seven hour flight us going to the uk bangers and mash that's a different way of communicating gay is a word that has changed over the course of 50 years imagine that is not 50 years but 5,000 years and imagine it's not just from like england and like you know england's little brother canada but Eng like canada and western ideologies to like far eastern ideologies um, so when we say, hey, I just want to read the text straightforward, um, 
we have to be like, hey, I can't do that unless I learn what it means for them to read it straightforward. So the question is, what is the straightforward reading of the text? What is God actually saying in Genesis chapter 1 to 3? Salud. Um, so the creation account of Genesis bears many resemblances. If you've never heard this before, this might come as a little bit of a shock. It bears many resemblances to other creation myths that were circulating around that time. Now, that's normal. Um, Paul's letters, Paul's epistles, they bear a ton of resemblances to other letters that orators and apostles used to write at that time. I did one of my grad papers in seminary on 2 Corinthians chapter 4, you know, when Paul's like, we are... Struck down but not destroyed. Like when I had to translate it, I think I used um, we are like headlocked but not suplexed. Um, that was common. People, people would use that, that exact same phraseology all the time. And so we have to be used as people to, who read the Bible to say there are other things in the Bible that what we have in Scripture is based off of. But there are these fundamental differences between the creation story that's in our Bibles and the creation myths that existed in the ancient Near East. And so what we have to do as good theologians is compare them and contrast them. And this is where all the good stuff comes out of Genesis. So as we compare and contrast, this is what we find. So God makes an ordered creation. The other ancient Near Eastern myths were not ordered. They were crazy after God was done making them. Uh, are the gods like these low, like these gods who got into power by shifty means at best? Um, the creation wasn't ordered; it was crazy. It was tumultuous. God makes a good creation, where as these other creation myths have stories that were tumultuous, full of war, even after creation is done. God's all powerful. Um, other creation stories talk about how these gods are clambering and fighting to be the top god to make something. And in our creation story, in the creation story of the Bible, there is no war. It's just God, the all-powerful, creating a universe. So we have to make our theological conclusions from that. So what theological conclusions can we make? We have a good, all-powerful God who's making an ordered creation, which in part resembles who he is. So we have three things already talking like to understand about who God is who is the king of this creation he's good he's ordered he's all powerful and then we have to start asking ourselves what about the seven days this is my favorite part this is the best thing I think I've ever learned about the intro chapters to Genesis the seven days there I mean there are a ton of views on the seven days either they're literal seven days or they're each day is an age or like literary framework stuff, whatever. Um, the days are actually, as far as I understand, a, an ancient Near Eastern temple inauguration. So when there were kings back in the day, or gods back in the day, they would make a temple where they could worship their god, and that's where the god's presence would reside. So you know, like if I was gonna make a temple here in Toronto for myself, <laughs> which I would not do, but if I was going to do it, I'd be like, okay, here's my temple, that's where my presence is going to reside, and I'm king over this little area. What we have in scripture is amazing. All of the heavens and all of the earth is God's temple, and he reigns and rules in all of it, and his presence is in all of it. So, um, this is God's universe, this is God's temple, and it is... All, all who exist in it exist there for God's glory. Um, and that's actually, that's why sin matters. Sin matters because, um, I mean, like, so politically and, um, like, jurisdictionally, I don't know if I'm saying that right, I could care less what you guys do as far as the law is concerned in another country. Because you're not breaking my country's laws. If you break my country's laws, I have to care. The same, was, the same is true everywhere. So another king in the ancient Near East wouldn't care if an Israelite broke an Israelite law because he wasn't king there. 
The reason why God cares about sin is this entire universe is his temple. And that's why what he says goes. What he says goes because he made the universe. He set it up as his temple. He resides there. And he made it good. And he made it glorious. And he made it to resemble him. Anyway, so cosmologically, it's a very fancy word to say how Moses understood the universe. Um, he's writing this... Um, from the perspective as he understands the universe. And that's a very key thing to understand. So, um, so the reason why I'm doing this is someone asked me a question about flat earth stuff, whether I'm a flat earther, and I am not um, at all. Um, but there's a reason why people are flat earthers. And to be honest, it's a little bit more, it's more interesting than you might think. So, um, Moses believed that the earth was flat. So he understood science the way people in his day and age understood science. He believed, and this is, you can read this in scripture if you've never read this before or had this understanding, it's okay, I'm not telling you anything crazy, I'm going to explain it in better detail in a second. So Moses believed that the earth was a flat disk. He believed that there were waters above and waters below. The waters below were like the chaos and the entire flat disk was held up by pillars, like the pillars of the earth, the foundations of the earth. Well, you've read that in your Bible. Sheol is under the waters, and then there are these waters above. Those waters above were held back by like this big dome. Um, and that's just ancient Near Eastern cosmology. And so that's what Moses believed. It's just what they all believed. Um, and so when we talk about flat earthers, like they're just reading the Bible super literally. They're reading those parts of scripture that talk about the earth being flat, like the disc of the earth. And, you know, there are ways to explain it. I don't want to get in a bay. I'm just describing to you. Um, they're just taking some of those things super literally. So that is the literal exegetical understanding of the Bible. Those who God is and what the seven days, their temple inauguration. Oh, Moses, I know. How could he not know? But let's talk a little bit about um, how science interacts with that. Because Moses is not scientifically correct. He's scientifically wrong about what the universe looks like. But how could he be right? So let's say, let's pretend God was going to reveal to him not only the theological truths of who he was, this good, ordered, all-powerful God who made the universe his temple. Let's pretend he's also going to communicate to Moses a scientific truth. What if he was right and the earth changed? I mean, you can say that about anything. Um, but I'm gonna, we'll get into that. So let's pretend that God is going to communicate both a theological truth and a scientific truth. The question that you need to ask yourself is, what scientific truth is he going to communicate to Moses? Is he going to communicate the scientific truth of his day? that believed in a flat earth with waters above and waters below? Is he going to communicate a scientific truth from the year like 1000 to 1400 medieval sciences? Is he going to communicate a scientific truth that makes sense in the early enlightenment? Is he going to communicate scientific truth as we as modern people live nowadays understand it? Or is he going to communicate a scientific truth so people can understand it 1000 years from now? Because we don't have all the answers. Look at how much science and our understanding of the human body and the universe has changed over the past 100 or 200 years. And the reason I bring all of that up is because if God primarily was revealing scientific truth, it changes. Scientific truth, our scientific theories are not strong and fast perfect. They never will be. They're theories. They have to be theories because we're putting them on the universe. I'm allowed to say this because I've studied science. So we take a framework and we put it on the universe. But there is philosophical, theological, cosmological truths that do not change despite science. Does that make sense? I don't know if you guys are tracking with me or understanding what I'm saying, but this is really important. Um, Moses' understanding was the science of his day. And the science is wrong, but the truth is still there. God still made the universe. Whether you believe the earth is flat or it's a sphere in a massive, beautiful universe, God still made it. I mean, we should be giving God more glory now than Moses or David ever could 
because we can see further, you know, like we can see stars from billions of light years away. And God made that and ordered it and called it good. Um, so I was asking questions a couple weeks ago about truth. Does something need to be factual, factually true, like science, in order to be or convey truth? And you've got to say the answers no. I mean, Moses is communicating wrong things scientifically. He's not sinning, you know. It's not a sin to tell someone something wrong. I mean, like, so when I was in university, we studied the Bohr Rutherford, Bohr Rutherford model of the atom. It's probably the model of the atom that everyone knows, you know. Like, here's the nucleus, and there's like all the electrons orbiting around it. It's not how it exists. It's literally a lie. Were my teachers sinning by telling me that? How are you living in sin for thinking about it that way and not thinking about the nucleus as a semi-solid and the electrons existing and probabilities in a cloud around it? Are you sinning because you don't know that? And am I somehow more holy than you for studying physics for four years? The answer is no. Um, I did read out of The Silent Planet by C.S. Lewis. Um, anyway, so all of that to say... It seems to me that from my upbringing, I, as a young earth creationist, um, was selectively literal. I was literal in the only way that I could understand it. I was literal in the sense that oh, I could only understand the Bible as a modern Western reader and therefore took my modern Western understanding of scripture and made it true and then I ran with it. But what I've come to learn is to look at scripture with an ancient, an Eastern eye. And there's a ton of things the Bible doesn't even care about, doesn't even talk about. One of the things is the Bible says nothing about the age of the earth. Um, I can get into that and give you some good details for it if you want. The Bible doesn't care. The Bible is, I'll actually give you, here's my take on what I believe as far as these things are concerned. The Bible is agnostic as to age. It does not care about the age of the earth, but it is vehement. It is very purposeful and letting you know about the theological ideas around who made the universe. The Bible doesn't leave anything up for interpretation. In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. There's no question. That's the thing the Bible cares about. So I am an old earth creationist. Um, for me, the cosmological, the geological, the physical, so physics... Um, that data is pretty tight. Um, so that's where I'm coming from. Um, I do not hold to like a day age theory. So my old earth creationism isn't, isn't like, oh, day one, a thousand years past day two, a thousand years past day three, a thousand years past. No. Um, I believe that that is a literary framework to denote uh, temple inauguration that God is making the universe as his temple and I can explain more about that if people have questions um, I do believe in a historical literal Adam and Eve but I do plenty of re reading um, to opposing views so I've read a bunch of Bruce Waltke who is an Old Testament scholar and Tremper Longman both of them believe that um, well, Walt Key for sure. I don't want to put words in a Tremper's mouth. Not like you're going to message him. Um, but Bruce Walt Key kind of believes that there were packs of hominids, humanoids, and then God chose some, put his image on them, and then commissioned them. So I read a lot about it. I'm not convinced. I mean, I still have questions, but I'm not convinced. Um, I believe... I struggle scientifically with neo-Darwinianism, so the idea of evolution and natural selection as a mechanism for evolution, um, that's tricky to me. I still have massive questions scientifically and theologically around ideas of intelligent design. Um, and lastly, I do not believe that the universe was made perfect. I believe that the universe was made good and that Eden was made good and that Adam and Eve were commissioned to bring order into that chaos. So clearly, all of my thoughts are not nailed down, and that's okay. That's why I told you my story, and that's why we're talking about this right now. Um, because you don't need to have all the answers 
to call yourself a Christian. You don't need to have all of the physics data settled, all the theological data settled, all the evolutionary stuff settled. I mean, I have massive questions about it. Um, theologically, the Bible is closed. You can only believe certain things and be a Christian. So you have to believe that God created the universe, blah, 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 all the stuff we already said. But scientifically, the Bible's pretty open. Um, um, I know that, what, sorry. Um, oh yeah, yeah, this is the one, I wanted to say like one kind of thing, um, pastorally before I close, and then we can do a Q&A. My legs are killing me. Um, so the pastoral kind of thing I wanted to say was, I know that making changes in this, um, department are really difficult. I mean, they're fundamental for me. It took me years to come to a place to go from being a young earth creationist to being an old earth creationist and all that goes with that. Um, because of those theological hurdles and presuppositions, I had to overcome. And so, like I said earlier, if you, if this is like the first time you've ever heard anyone talk about stuff like this and you're like, hey, you know what? I grew up being a young earth creationist and even hearing the word evolution makes me think, hey, you're a pagan. Just do yourself a favor and think about it openly. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying believe those things wholeheartedly, be convinced, hook, line, and sink. I'm just saying think about it. Challenge your thoughts. That's what thinking is about. Um, anyways, so that's how science and the Bible interact. The Bible is primarily theological, not scientific. The Bible prohibits very few things. I would say personally that the Bible prohibits evolution as a grand theory of everything um, because evolution as a gra grand theory of everything is anti-God. But other than that, the Bible is pretty open. Um, anyways, so that's how they interact. Scientists, to be honest, Christians should have a huge love of science. Um, science shouldn't scare us. It should uh, mesmerize us as we find out more and more about the universe. Um, I'm going to scroll up. I'm going to do a Q&A. You guys, I'm going to actually have a swig of my whiskey. If you guys have questions, comment them. I'm going to go through and try to catch up. Um, and if not, it's been a slice. Thank you for always in posting insane opinions for things that you've had questions on because it helps Scott. Yeah, so thank you for that. Um, I do this kind of stuff on purpose. I have this belief that this is why I kind of do these live videos and it's kind of why I'm, I try to be as honest um, as I can be on Instagram. First off, for the reason a lot of people are superficial and fake. Not you guys, but that's the tendency of our culture. But number two, I believe that there's no real growth without real challenge and real questions. And so if you're the kind of person that doesn't want to ask questions and doesn't want to admit that you have questions, you're going to have to learn to be okay with who you are and what you think forever because it's just how you learn. Um, and so I get smoke showed all the time about things I believe. And it's tough. Like, And I, I really sit down and think like, you know, so, you know, I'm going to get into something crazy. Um, God's fingerprint. Ooh. Okay, so um, I'm going to scroll through. I'm not going to distract myself. But I think, thank you very much for that. It's very important to challenge yourself as you... Hebrew, as you, what do you, did you read up? Yes, I read out of the Silent Planet. Um, what if he was right? Okay. Okay, I don't actually think I missed too much. Young Earth creationism. Belief systems determine the way you live. 100%. Off topic, but you look like, yes. Um, okay. Flood can't explain can't explain why the earth presents itself anciently. Yes, that's actually true. So I could hop into that. Actually, that's too scientific and I haven't read too much about it. Um, so that, let me scroll up to the question. What do you think God's fingerprint and signature is in his creation? Um, I would say it's manifold. I would say that you know, like I've seen the Louis Giglio stuff where there's like that God particle, that cross that holds everything together. And that's really cute. And I mean, it's true. Like luminin or whatever it's called. Um, I would say the things, God's fingerprint is in all of us. It's in all of his creation. 
So there's this poet, um, a Christian poet, for whatever reason the name is slipping my, my mind, and he believes that because we have an infinite God, every single thing in creation must be infinitely different. So if you take two maple leaves, one off one maple tree and then another one off the same maple tree and look at them, they cannot be the same because God is infinitely expressing his creative ability. And so I believe that all of nature is just riddled with the fingerprints of God. Take humanity. Um, humanity as being made in God's image. There's so much to that that I don't want to, that I don't even need to get into. Just take us physically, you know, like poets will write poems about bodies forever. Like I've like I don't even want to mention a body part. I'll mention my ears cuz you can't really see them. Have you ever looked at people's ears? Ears are crazy. They're so weird and they're so different and they're so unique. Um and I think that's God's fingerprint on creation. The fact that creation is beautiful and elegant and ordered even in a, in a fallen state it is mesmerizing and infinite. Um Okay, are there any more, what's your take on theistic evolution? So, <laughs> I think that's the only way evolution could exist. I'm not convinced scientifically that natural selection is the mechanism for Darwinianism or evolution, personally. I mean, don't take everything I say as scientific truth. Like, I have read a bunch about it because I did, I do really care. I don't care as much anymore. Um, the thing that I will say about theistic evolution is this. It has a great idea as far as first principles are concerned that evolution could only exist with an all-powerful supernatural God directing it. And so if at the end of all things, you know, like God's like, hey, gotcha, it was evolution the whole way and I did it, I, w I wouldn't be upset, I wouldn't be surprised, I'd be like, oh, of course, it needs your power to do that. I mean, I'm not convinced because of laws, certain laws of thermodynamics and, you know, classic intelligent design answers. But then I'm not, also not convinced on the other side. So, um, I think that's all the questions that I can see. You only need faith to be a follower of Christ. It's true. Um, evolution has no explanation for dinosaurs. Only Genesis does. I mean... That's fine. Okay, um, I think I got everything, guys. This has been a slice. Um, this has been great. I am going to sign off because it doesn't look like there's any other questions or something that I've missed. So, guys, thank you for tuning in. Um, if you do have questions still, you can DM me. I'm going to post this on my, my page or whatever for the next 24 hours, but I'm also going to download it and upload it to my YouTube channel which is a stupid, I feel like it's a stupid thing for even me to have to say in this day and age, but I do have a YouTube channel. I never thought I would have one, but this will be there, so if you are so inclined to listen, you can listen. Anyways, thank you, God bless, and I will chat with you guys later on. Adios.